So here we are again with another little edition of our um, TV show, <laughs> such as it is. Um, and I'd like to welcome Alison Futrell today. Uh, I don't know Alison really well, but all I know is that we're in the same political education group and she's ace. So welcome, Alison. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> um, so the first question that I've got for you today is, um, are you working class? Do you think you're working class? OK, I... I, th I think maybe so, although um, when I was growing up, when I was sort of a little kid, my, my dad worked in Nigeria um, and he, he had a decent job. It was a manual job, um, but he only came home a couple of times a year for a couple of weeks. But then when I got to about 13 and he was sort of in his mid to late 50s by then, um, there was a recession on, he couldn't find work. Um, and so even though they had managed to buy their own house, um, so, so we had a roof over our heads, but our situation changed quite dramatically. And my dad actually at that generation, it was, he felt embarrassed to be claiming dole. Mm. And I remember it getting to a real crisis point before, because obviously they had savings, mm -hmm. but that just got, but you know, living off that while my dad was trying to find work. And I remember my mum and dad having an argument because he would not go down the dole office. Mm -hmm. um, and he did, he did go in the end, mm -hmm. but it was extreme embarrassment to him and I didn't really understand why at the mm -hmm. time I, I did, because I knew of loads of other people whose dads were unemployed um but yeah and my mum my mum didn't work as well so he must have been earning enough money yeah for him not to have to work mm -hmm. so on the one hand I think well my mum was a, a stay-at-home housewife uh, most of my friends' mums had part-time or even full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, things changed a bit. And mm -hmm. when I went to college at the age of 18, and my dad had still been sort of in and out of jobs, um, if there hadn't been a student grant at the time, I, I would not have been able to go to college because they would not have been able to fully support me. Mm -hmm the four years that I was in further education mm, yeah in the last inter, um, interview or chat with um, Dean Kavanagh we were talking about how class um, I mean you've got general sort of um, things that can be said that are true of the working class and of the of the middle class like so the middle class um, might have savings might own their own home maybe you know the the woman can afford to stay home with the kids, etc. But they also they have things like connections that will help them get on. Um, and working class people generally don't have those. But I think you were saying to me that your mum and dad were very much traditional working class backgrounds themselves. And that's yeah. interesting to me is that quite often what happens with um, middle class people, if they fall on hard times, they do have those connections and they do have sort of relatives and inheritance, a bit of an inheritance yeah. from here and there. You know, they have cushions that yeah. m working class people who've done well for themselves don't have. So if, you know, the shit hits the fan, they normally they will drop like a stone. And, yeah. you know, it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to find their way back to that position of security. So I think that's quite interesting to it's an interesting when you're on the market margins of one or the other yeah. but your background is working class I think it can you're much you're still you're still precarious even though it sounds like your dad had done really well for himself you know in being able to sort of provide for the family and yeah, yeah. although it must have been hard not seeing him so much it's, yeah I mean I I grew up not knowing any different and in fact when he did come back full time it was really odd with him being around the house all the time. It took a right. long time to get used to him being there all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But another thing about, like, my mum and dad's generation, they they were very aspirational, you know. Yes. And yeah. yeah. There was this kind of, oh, well, I've bettered myself. Definitely. Kind of 
that that was a real thing wasn't it in that yeah. generation there was a big push people thought you're not though I don't know in some sense there was working class pride maybe people that were involved in uh, mm. the frontline fight within unions and things they felt like they were on a mission and they felt like you know solidarity was important and that working yeah. class identity but there was also this other other realm within the working class because it's not homogenous like any group you know it's not all the same but but there was this um because I had that my granddad my nan you know sort of council estate backgrounds but my granddad worked on the tugs on the Mersey and worked his way up and became a captain of the tugs Right. and I yeah I think they thought they were middle class (laughs) the house was pristine you know it was like it was a bungalow it wasn't like but it was in a a, a nice little road and I think they felt oh you know we've arrived they had done well for themselves and I think like in those days some people within the working class could could do well you know in maybe a way that which they they can't so much now it's harder um, I mean, I've got my mum came from a very large family. She had loads, loads of sisters and a couple of brothers. Yeah. And even now, you know, I mean, she's she's got one sister who who you know a little bit like my mum feels like she's mm-hmm. done well and she's mm-hmm. bettered herself. And yeah, I've got another another auntie who um, lives on a council estate. They bought, they managed to buy their council house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, while Maggie was in. Um, yeah. But my my uncle was a, a factory worker. My auntie always worked. She was did, you know, home help and factory work and that sort of thing. Yeah. And they've got a different they've got a completely different kind of outlook. Yeah. Yes, yeah. They, they, they've got their own house mm-hmm. and it's lovely, you know, and they've got a nice garden and everything. Yes, yeah. Um, but there's there's a different, there's just a different mm-hmm. attitude, really. Yeah, and yeah. They both, and, and I love both my aunties, so they're, they're both great, but they, yes, they've yeah. got it's changed. Outlook, it, does, you know? it does change people, I think. If you're working class and you do well, um, I think it can it can make it some people don't lose their roots but some people then feel like I have become a different person <laughs> you know I've yeah. become I'm a better person because I've done what you know or something like that but mm-hmm. but the thing about it is is I think working class people even when they've done well and they've got status and they've got a nice house to to middle class people they're still detectable as not quite like them <laughs> so it's just an interesting dynamic um just so, talking about people, um, working class people owning their, buying their houses, their council houses. Russell C- Kane um, did an amazing video on, it's on YouTube. I'll see if I can post the link below this oh, one. Yeah. And it was all about that. It was, it was a radio, I think it was like maybe a production for Radio 4 that he did. Um, and he talks about his own parents who managed to buy their council house and they installed a swimming pool in the back garden. No. <laughs> they did like the full thing, like pillars on the front door and all of this kind oh, of thing. It's God. like, because his dad had done well. He was like a working class bloke yeah. who'd done good and they felt like they'd arrived, you know, oh, said, this yeah. is it, we're middle class. And, um, but he said, when, he went back when you go back you know this has been kind of studied and when people go back and have a look at these council houses that have been bought by the working class um sometimes you know they've been sold on or whatever and that person's moved on but whatever the people that are living in those houses now they've become dilapidated so the working class incomes aren't what they were um so that little bubble where working class people could afford to do that and feel like they'd done well and that class had yeah. gone it disappeared when you look at those houses now they're in a really bad state of disrepair they've got loads of mm-hmm. you know the roofs are in a mess and they're dilapidated and the people that are living in them are sort of in a worse position than you know than, than where it all started off when those houses were first sold so yeah, all, and what, like, looking at those houses tells the story of of the journey the working class have been on it's almost like you've been conned into thinking Absolutely. and yeah. also the the financialization of, of housing really because when yeah. those houses were sold they were yes. sold very cheaply yes to, to those council tenants yes yeah. and it's something that winds my mother up no end does <laughs> it's it quite yeah. funny yeah that she she feels a bit out you know uh a bit hard done by that she 
bought a house mm-hmm. at market price and yeah, yeah. My sister got a house that's just the same size as my mum's house more yes. or less yes yeah and yeah. definitely yeah. same size garden yes yeah and she paid next to nothing for it <laughs> Which is uh, yeah, yeah. quite funny. <laughs> um, we could move on to this quest next question now, really, because uh, I was going to bring this up later. But you're involved in some quite interesting work around housing um, with the te- your involvement with the tenants union, aren't you? And I know sort of with uh, we had loads of housing issues in this country and a housing crisis already before COVID. But obviously, like since since COVID, it, that has we've had a massive increase in people approaching us for support. Um, because of threatened homelessness um, in our council so I know that you're involved in that work do you want to tell us a little bit more about how you got involved and what sort of things that you do and what you've what what insights you've got from that yeah okay so um, I'm a tenant and I have been for god probably about eight years now Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm also self-employed or kind of I'm a freelancer Mm -hmm. and I work through an agency so it's it's hard to define you know sometimes I I can't say I've got my own business yeah uh, but I I do work for myself and uh, I do sort of medium term contracts of sort of four to five months that's what it tends to be these days Um, And I was due to start a contract in the March. It was a regular thing. Every year, a particular company has me in for a couple of uh, of months. And then later on in the year, they have me back for a couple of months working on site. And then at the beginning, when lockdown happened and, you know, offices were shut and it was like, well, how am I going to work? Uh, what am I going to do for money? And then my next thought was, how am I going to pay my rent? Mm-hmm. What's going to happen? Am I going to get chucked out or, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I was online and there was loads of stuff online, all these groups springing up, um, you know, um, COVID advice, Facebook page, mm-hmm. not just advice about the virus, but advice about, you know, people getting together who were in difficult situations. There were self-employed COVID groups, you know, where uh, I went on to a few of those where people were saying, oh, you know, we were sort of trying to make suggestions for each other. Sometimes it's easier to sort someone else's problem out than sort your own. Sometimes you're too close to the problem, aren't you? That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can go into that state of panic and overwhelm yeah. and other people can see it more clearly sometimes. Exactly. And I was panicking. I really was. And I, um, there were a lot of petitions and things coming up mm-hmm. online. And one of them yeah. was um, for self-employed people, I think it was, you know, petition the government. Because at that point, they had done, the government had done nothing. They'd said nothing about Mm -hmm. tenants. They had said nothing about self-employed people. We were all just hanging, you know, thinking, well, what what about us, you know? That's the thing I was Um, thinking at the time is that's a terrifying period for people, you know, and the information that the, the, the way to lead in that situation is to make that a priority, you know, to get that information out to people. Don't worry, you know, we've got this in hand, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there was just silence. There was, yes. The government was saying, oh, yeah, yeah we're, we're going to look after big businesses. And it's like, well, that yeah. doesn't help me. Yes. If their offices are shut. Yes. You know, yes. I can't yeah. yes. So this, yeah. this petition, it was one of those ones where it was a template letter and you click through to, um, to send it to your local MP mm-hmm. and also local councillors. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, I recognised the name of one of the councillors. Oh, right. um, yeah. And uh, he, I had been a, a member of the the Labour Party. Had, had been in when I lived in Lady Barn, another area. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of knew his name. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I thought, right. Well, if I'm sending it to Jeff Smith, then I'm mm-hmm. I'm going to click all the others as well. I'm just sending mm-hmm. it off. 
Mm. And he phoned me back, Brilliant. which I wasn't expecting. I was like, oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I was just expecting it to go out in the ether and six yeah. months time, someone will say, look at all these signatures we've got. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, and he was great. He gave me loads of advice. I didn't even know how to claim universal credit. Yeah. I, I, I'd never done that before yeah and I was thinking I, I you know I was just so confused and um he gave me loads of advice and he said well you're gonna have to claim separately for this make sure you get a housing benefit mm -hmm. and then he said um I'm involved in a tenants union you know if mm -hmm. um you know if you if if you come along to our meetings and mm -hmm. um you can get some advice and you know um so so I did and it was more a kind of I was so grateful to yeah. get help and advice yeah um <clears throat> also I hadn't contacted my I, I went through a letting agency mm -hmm. and I was so worried I didn't want to tell them that yeah. I didn't have any work yeah. and it was just like two weeks before my rent was due and I was like I don't want to talk to them I don't want to speak to them because as soon as they know mm -hmm. they're going to kick me out mm -hmm. you know yeah and uh, he said you must speak to them as soon as you can okay. and yeah. just be really honest and explain the situation yeah and I did that and actually they I was lucky um, mm -hmm. and they were very understanding brilliant um so I joined the tenants union. It was more a kind of a, a gratitude thing. Yeah. I thought, well, he's helped me out so much. Yes. That yeah, I'll support this. Yes. And then I very quickly um, became really involved with it. Mm -hmm. um, all the all the volunteers, uh, there's 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 um a solidarity group where right. We'll have meetings, perhaps if somebody's got a problem, perhaps they've been served an eviction notice yes. unfairly, or they've got repair issues with their property the landlord isn't sorting out. Yes. Or they've had a sudden massive rent hike mm -hmm. that for no reason that they weren't expecting. Yeah. And we all get together and and try to figure out a plan. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. it's nice because although we have the there are three members of staff mm -hmm. and we can get guidance. Uh, and also from uh, Greater Manchester Law Centre, right. we are friendly with them and we can ask them to, to come to meetings and to advise us. Mm -hmm. So you feel like you've you've got the technical help there if you need it. Yeah. But it is very member led. Yes. Um, yeah. Where you just all get together. And another really important thing is the person who's got the problem. Mm -hmm. the, the One of the most important things is to involve them in the process and give them something to do. Yeah. So you don't just take the problem. I say, right, you sit down. Yes. We'll sort that all that out for you. Yeah. You you get them involved. Yeah. Wow. Um, because if you give someone responsibility, you empower mm -hmm. them. Yes. And if they're yeah. empowered, they feel more confident. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I learned at the start of, of lockdown, yeah. and I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was going on. Didn't know what was going to happen to me. Yeah. The last thing I felt was confident. Yeah. So I, I felt utterly helpless. Yeah. So it was only through helping other people yes. um, yeah. and, and taking on some responsibility myself as well. Yeah. But I, I started to feel a bit... That's an amazing that. ethos. Really, really impressive, isn't it? You know, to think about that because probably there is the expertise there that people could take the problem away completely. Yeah. You know, not completely, but they could do all of those tasks for somebody but to say yeah. we're all a team on it kind of thing that yeah. person's getting to do something active proactive and they're not going to feel like yet again it's just a situation that's out out of their hands and out of their control entirely kind of thing it's really important mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought of that but that, that's a really good approach can we name check the counsellor because I think I know who it is 
is Ben it Clay. Was ben, ben Clay, yeah. We yeah, should check yeah. Nick because he's brilliant on all of that stuff. And I know he's been an amazing advocate for Tenants Union. Yeah. Um, and it's because of him that I started to get involved in meetings as well. Um, yeah. Ours have stalled a little bit, our plans in Cheshire, because um, one of the members of the group that was leading it was unwell. But um, we're, I think we're getting back on track soon with that as well. And I'm really grateful to him because I'm quite a newish councillor and I don't know my way around all these systems or wouldn't know where to start really with helping people. And I kind of knew that Ben was involved and was able to call him and say someone had been in touch with me and this was the situation that they were in. Um, and he was able to kind of talk me through a little bit with that. So we need something localised like that in Cheshire as well, um, which I yes. hope that, that we will be able to develop. But it's brilliant that it's spurred you on to get more involved, you know, with that work. Yeah, that well, I'm actually, yeah. I'm actually on the committee now. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, so I'm not a staff, I don't get paid for it or anything. Yeah. But mm-hmm. we, we did a lot of... Um, stuff around the governance and and looking at the structure of the tenants union mm-hmm. so we we've got a committee now um, to make any big decisions yeah so. amazing oh, that's really really good um so i'll go on to my next question we, we can come back to tenancy related um stuff maybe at some point um so how did you how did you become politically aware what was your journey because obviously we don't get taught anything about how politics works in school and a lot of people feel like politics has got nothing to do with me it doesn't affect my life or I'm not interested and there's lots of other fun things you could be doing so what was it that got you involved and how did you learn more it's funny because when I was in primary school um I remember there being an election on and the kids, a lot of the, and maybe it's because I'm from South Wales (laughs) and everything's all a bit political down there, or it certainly was at the time. Yeah. Because I remember, um, I think some, some of the parents must have been members of parties. Um, I know one lad came in and they all had stickers (laughs) <laughs> and he had a Plaid Cymru sticker, you know. So his dad must have been, you know, canvassing for Plaid Cymru or, you know, involved in the party in some way. Mm-hmm. And there were lots and lots of kids with Labour stickers. And um, I was quite intrigued by this. And I went home and I said to my mum, what? I was telling her about the kids and she was quite... Um, Uh, dismissive about it and I said well who do we vote for and she said it's nobody's business it's Mm -hmm. personal Mm -hmm. um, politics Mm -hmm. and um, wouldn't really be drawn on it Um, and but I do remember and my family very female dominated right all these sisters Mm -hmm. and um, she was one of the younger ones so a lot of A lot of my aunties were almost retired when I was a kid, you know, and and widowed, uh, Mm -hmm. a a couple of them were, and and, and quite different sort of lifestyles, really. But my granddad had been a Labour councillor. Oh, wow. Great. Yeah. And I don't know, I suspect it's the way that they were brought up, but Mm -hmm. they mostly very outspoken and very opinionated (laughs) and I do remember arguments not nasty arguments but Mm. a lot of discussion around current affairs you know when I I didn't really understand what they were talking about Mm -hmm. but there was always a lot of a lot of debate going Mm. on yeah um but I I do remember and this is a bit sad um, because none of my friends in school, when I got to be a teenager, nobody ever talked about politics. Yeah. I spent a lot of time in the library as a kid. Uh, I loved reading and I would just go in there and stay in there to read. Mm-hmm. And there was a, a section on feminism. Right. So I read a lot of stuff by Jermaine Greer and yeah. Dworkin. I don't even yes. know that. You say I know, name. I know that name, yeah. But I haven't I, read, I, yeah. I've learned quite recently. Now, I was reading that stuff and, and kind of had nobody to discuss it with. Yeah. Um, but it's only more recently I've learned that um, 
to walk in was a Marxist. Right. So yeah. Whether I, I picked up some stuff in there. Yeah. yeah. I also remember looking at, at their descriptions of women's lives and thinking, well, I can't really say that about my family. And some of them it yeah. applied to. Some of them had very traditional kind of lives. Yes. Yeah. Not all of them. And also, yeah. they certainly weren't downtrodden in any way. They were. <laughs> They're all quite fast. Yeah. <laughs> so I find it all the more fascinating. So there, yeah. there was that aspect. Yeah. Um, but by the time, by the time, I think when I was 19, there was a general election. But I remember it was coming up to my 18th birthday mm -hmm. and I couldn't wait to be 18 because that meant I could vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I couldn't wait to be able to. So it was nothing to do with being yeah. able to go into a pub mm -hmm. the important thing about oh, both wow. meeting meant that I could have a say so you've I always been interested really I suppose I suppose yeah. I have without yeah. without studying it at all mm -hmm. but I remember Margaret Thatcher being on telly and I remember mm -hmm. just not liking her yeah. attitude mm. without even understanding what she was saying yes just yeah. being very patronizing and yeah. very common Ending. she did and cold she didn't seem yeah like I mean I know she that they made a big thing that you know she was a grocer's daughter and she yes from yeah. the beginning. but she didn't seem like that she seemed like somebody who was um sort of thought well yeah. a, a little bit like oh well I've I've done well for myself yes. and I'm yeah and yeah yeah, I picked that up as well as a kid. I can remember that. I can remember that election, but not asking my mum, what's the difference? How do you know which one's the best, you know, from Labour and Conservative? But I didn't, We our family didn't talk about politics, really. They weren't really interested in it. And there wasn't, my dad apparently did go to Labour Party meetings, but I didn't know that until, as a kid. I wasn't aware of it because he just didn't discuss it with us. But um, mm. yeah, but um I can remember that. And I can remember my great gran hated Thatcher because she took the milk off the children. And yeah. she never forgave her for that. <laughs> but my great gran didn't think a woman should be in politics anyway. She thought a woman's place was at home. <laughs> it's funny you should say that because my mum, my mum, when she talks about politicians, they're all they're all in it for themselves. They're all lying in their own pockets. They're one as bad as the other. Yeah. She's very disdainful. Mm -hmm. But... I think I rem I think I got the impression when Thatcher was in, I think my mother had a respect for her because to my mother, there was this woman mm -hmm. who was in charge and telling a bunch of men what to do. She yes. was in charge of those blokes and she was going <laughs> down the law. And my mother liked that, I think. Right. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. It's an interesting one within feminism, that, isn't it? Because to me, she was doing things in a more masculine, in a more traditionally masculine way, yeah. rather than in the way that women do things. I think women do things. And then other women don't like you saying that sometimes because they say, well, there isn't a typical male and female way of doing things. It's all just culture yeah. anyway. And it's like, I don't know. I, I don't know what which is true. But but the way that women, I mean, I, I know women can bully other women just as bad as, yeah. you know, you can you can find that that can be sometimes as difficult as sexism to deal with. Maybe not. Yeah. It's not got quite the sting to it. But um, but I think that's when they're acting out of out of outside of the feminine ways of doing things. It's not as collaborative. It's more combative. And, you know, yeah. I don't know, there's this weird it's okay to be combative as a woman, but I don't know whether the inclination to be is as strongly there, you know? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I suppose the, th the thing that I would, would look at, re regardless of methods, did Thatcher do much for women? Mm, not at all. Um, I don't think she did. You know, she might have yeah. been an example of a woman in a high position. Yeah. But, you know, I don't, I don't think it changed things very much. Really. It might be more about toxic masculinity, because if you look at someone like Jacinda Ahern, she's, I think she's a really good role model for leadership, whether it's male or female. The, the New Zealand, 
Was it Arden oh, or Ahern? I'm not sure. Yeah, the New Zealand yeah. Prime Minister. Um, the way that she communicates and stuff, she keeps people involved. She gives a little check-in update. She's fairly informal, but she's still professional, you know, in the way that she does things. So I think it inspires trust from people. Yes. Um, and I mean, she's handled the, the crisis, the COVID crisis really, really well. Um, yeah. You know, and, and it looks as if they've looked after people there. But 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 Jeremy Corbyn, you know, by the same token, doesn't have a toxic masculine way of doing things either. You know, so it's kind of don't know. I, to me, it seems like more of a sort of um, it's more in the sort of like female arena. That type of leadership yeah. can be done by men or women. But traditionally, you know, it's more collaborative um, and less combative and less hierarchical bit more relaxed it's kind of I don't know whereas it felt like Thatcher just got subsumed into that's what that her politics were that anyway you know they were about hierarchy weren't they and yeah of course and that kind yeah. of thing so mm. okay yeah and yeah. go, going back to you know um getting into politics I yeah. I would say that you know up until probably about six or seven years ago and I I would I would have always considered myself a socialist and I would have always said vote Labour vote Labour mm -hmm. um, but without any real understanding of what socialism is it was all yeah. instinctive to yes me. All, yeah and because I didn't know anyone who wanted to talk about politics for mm -hmm. most of my life because my mother my parents wouldn't discuss mm -hmm. it really um, and none of my peers were, were particularly, you know, wanting to talk about politics. Mm -hmm. um, and then I remember when Blair got in and I was just, I was so delighted. I was yeah. like, oh, this is it now. Everything's going to be fine. Yeah. And all our problems mm -hmm. are, you know, very sort of naive. Mm kind of view of it and of course within a couple of years I was I was just horribly disillusioned mm -hmm. and although I carried on voting Labour I did it with a peg on my nose Me and too. I, I, mm. I stopped caring about politics I Me stopped too. talking about it mm -hmm. I didn't want to think about it I didn't want to watch the news I didn't want to read newspapers mm -hmm. uh, everything was a mess and you know, there's nothing nothing we could do. And um, I still felt very strongly that, that there was a better way of, mm -hmm. of doing things. Yeah. And that there was something fundamentally wrong with yeah. the way we were living, with the way society was run. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a funny thing happened. Um, I, I ended up... Um, renting in Manchester that's a whole other long story mm -hmm. but I ended up sharing a house with someone that I knew um, a, a, a friend of mine a guy that I'd known for a few years um, and he was uh, he, he could be quite a contrarian he was when I when I first knew him I used to think oh you're just trying to pick an argument you because <laughs> we might subject of some something in you know some current event where, you know I'd make some comment about oh that's really bad and he'd say oh well some people might say and he'd come out with the opposing sort yeah, of yeah yeah oh shut up you're talking rubbish and, I, <laughs> and, he'd, go back up and he'd, he'd start laughing at me and uh I'd say, You're, well, you're sounding like a Tory now. You're just a Tory, you are. And he said, oh, I didn't say I thought that. Mm -hmm. I just said some people might say that. And I kind <laughs> of gradually got the, the I, I got the, the, I started to understand eventually that he loved debating. Mm -hmm. And he didn't care which side of what, whatever you want to talk about, he would take the other, other <laughs> side. Yeah. And um, he kind of forced me into thinking analytically about politics. And he right. forced me to think about what socialism meant to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as his politics went, I think he probably 
he probably veered more towards anarchism you know that that was his kind of um mm -hmm. uh, point of view but yeah. um but he really got me thinking about socialism properly mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. first time ever mm -hmm. um, without reading loads of books about it, without going and studying Marxism or anything. Mm -hmm. And I got a far more sense about what I felt socialism mm -hmm. was. Yeah. Um, and uh, he doesn't live in this country anymore, actually, but <laughs> I still keep in touch with him. We yeah. still have a chin So wagon. with that, um, what difference does it make, do you think, to your... Because obviously we've done a bit more studying on it now. We have looked at, into some a bit more depth into Marxism and things like uh, socialism and capitalism yeah. and how it how it works and the Labour Party and the history of the Labour Party and things like that trade unions so but getting that deeper understanding of socialism in terms of your place in the world and how things were working around you in the country how did it feel did it help you make more sense of all of that or was it a relief to know it or does it make has it made you more frustrated how, what what sort of impact does it have do you think it's it's a double-edged sword really because i mean on the one hand you realize that it's like my god the same things have been happening over and over and over again for mm -hmm. years mm. and uh, you know we are still struggling mm. um but on the other hand it's a huge relief mm. it's a huge relief to know that it's not just me that feels like this yeah it's a huge relief to know that stuff that I felt instinctively mm. and if, if you try to say some if someone says oh why do you think this is right or this is wrong mm. and all you can say is because it doesn't seem right or it doesn't yeah. seem fair yeah to be able to know that there is a whole theory there's a whole system that backs that up yes it's incredibly reassuring yeah and it's a revelation actually I, I feel that as well it's also um I think it's a relief in that sense as well because you you can look at your family you know I used to look at my family so my my stepdad was a car mechanic um, my mum and my stepdad always struggled for money. Um, my mum always had to work, you know. Well, no, there was, I think there was a few years when, because she had four of us. So when the younger ones were at home, um, I think she was at home. I can remember, like, we couldn't go in the fridge for food in between meals or anything like that. You get your head bitten off, you know. But yeah. I know that they worried and struggled about money. And I went to um, a grammar school and there was a lot, most of the kids there were, not struggling whatsoever you know they had nice big detached houses and went on um, skiing holidays and you know had private tutors and all this kind of thing and that when you go for when you had conversations or you overheard conversations and the and the culture it was very much like well it's about how hard you work you know and to me I used to look at my stepdad and I used to think well he does work really hard <laughs> that can't be true it can't be about that because he works really hard in outdoor conditions you know the garage was like freezing that he worked in he'd come home covered in oil you know yeah. and uh and I think I that's not that story doesn't tell the whole picture it just doesn't explain why some people are doing well and some people just can't no matter how hard they work so it never really made sense to me but once you understand those systems in a bit more depth all of a sudden you realize well it's not about personal blame it's not about inadequacy no. it's just it's just rigged it just is and some people can get on in it and some people can't and here's the reasons for that here's why it has to work the way it does and I think it makes you a bit more it makes you on the one hand like you said relaxed because you think ah okay that makes sense now mm -hmm. um I understand it and then on the other hand it makes you more fired up because you think well that's horrendous we're gonna <laughs> it <has to> stop <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, it's yes. quite funny. Um, when at my first job after leaving college, mm -hmm. um, I ended up working for a company in Runcorn. That's how I ended up in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a furniture company, a Schreiber Furniture. They used to be really famous, but mm -hmm. they've long gone now. Um, and I was working in the drawing office. Um, and I, 
it felt like I was earning a fortune. It was 10 grand <laughs> a year. That was my that was my salary <laughs> in 1990. And I felt like my God, I'm, and, you know, after living on a student grant and, and doing, you know, bar work and, yeah. and stuff, you know, to top up my money. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but within a year, I was redundant. Um, and that's been the story of my life. I've been made redundant a mm-hmm. lot. Yeah. But I was, um, I, my, my boyfriend had moved up with me as well, you know, and we were renting a little place. And um, he was, um, he had an office job, but he wasn't earning a fortune and neither of us could afford to support the other, you know, fully. And um, when I got made redundant, I thought, what am I gonna do? You know, what's gonna happen? Mm-hmm. And the, the uh, management were offering the, the office staff, because they made swathes of people redundant. Mm-hmm. Um, it was They were bought out by MFI. I mean, you hear this all the time, you know, companies get bought out and there's loads of redundancies. Yes. Yeah. So someone's it, doing all right out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what they did was they, they offered the office staff jobs on the factory floor. Mm-hmm. So um, I was like, well, can't it's not really what I plan to do with my life but Mm -hmm. I've got to pay the bills Mm. and I ended up working on the factory floor and they used to move us around to different bits but it was hard I mean I was we'd have like a stack of like wardrobe end panels behind us and Mm -hmm. you you were on an assembly line so you'd have to be putting these into the boxes and Mm. So some of it was really hard physical work and mm. I'd come home from work and I'd just fall asleep. You know, I was yeah. probably fitter than I've ever been in my life. To yeah. Be yeah. But I was actually earning more on the factory floor yeah. than I had been in the office because we right. got both. Wow, right. So we'd have yeah. a big board with the, the amount on what the bonus was that week and be like, go faster, go faster. Look, the numbers are going up. <laughs> Somebody be going, hurry up, you lot! I want to, I want to book my holiday next week. Come on, we got to. <laughs> but it was a, it was, it was an eye opener because I'd never, I never sort of looked down on somebody who did factory work. I have people in my family who did factory work, you know, mm-hmm. but. Um, it was it was working there with with people of all different ages there were there were kids there you know they were sort of 17 18 yeah uh, working in that factory and you think they they're probably going to just end up doing that sort mm-hmm. of work you know that's where they are and that's probably where they'll be you know mm-hmm. I remember thinking that at the time yeah and thinking about myself and thinking a recession I've had it because to get a job you have to have work experience mm. and you know how am I gonna get anything else mm. so in it, it was good that I was earning a bit more money mm. um but it was it was very boring work yeah and hard work yeah but then there were older people there who had worked in that factory they mm. are wise. yeah and Everyone was so different, you know, it's this sort of attitude that, oh, well, if you're thick, you do mm-hmm. manual work. Mm-hmm. That was rubbish because mm-hmm. there was um, one of the um, older guys used to give me a lift. I didn't drive at the time and he lived around the corner from me. So I used to get a lift in to work with him. Mm-hmm. And he loved classical music and I'd get in the car and he'd have classical music on and be telling me all about the composer and, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And um, and then... It's an interest. There's a lot of intelligence, isn't there, in the working class that's not been realised. It's not been... There's the potential, you know, there's the potential, it's not a problem of potential and it's not a problem of um, horizons and it's just that those opportunities aren't. And those kind of opportunities, like where you work in a factory, but you do all right money wise, because I can remember my mum did did that. She worked in, um, she did machining. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, she loved it. She really enjoyed it. Yeah. That suited her 
I mean, even though it was repetitive, whatever, she didn't, some people don't mind that so much. My mum didn't mind it, um, but yeah. she really liked the crack, you know, amongst yeah. like, yeah, the, the workers there and stuff. And she's always been a hard worker and she takes a pride in anything that she does, you know what I mean? So, but that go faster, go faster culture and, you know, maybe you can get a bonus or whatever. I'm pretty sure, I would imagine that because of the way that working class employment has gone, that that will have been... Um, undermined now they won't you won't be able to probably get the same bonuses that you and incentives it'll just be expected that you'll go faster and faster or you'll be out on your ear and there'll be someone in yeah. to replace you which is how capitalism works isn't it everything gets kind of diminished all the terms and conditions all the way along the line over time have to be because capitalism has to make has to continue to increase its profit you know yeah it, it doesn't it grinds to a halt if it doesn't keep going faster and making more and yeah and yeah. that, there's that that line, isn't there? Um, pro- the rate of profit has the tendency to fall over time. Yes. So yes. Capitalism yeah. is always trying to pull more and more to, out of to its workers to stay yeah. or make more profit. Yeah, and it disproportionately pull, pulls more out of its workers at the bottom end of the scale, doesn't it? As well, that's the other thing that we've seen. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I, I, it's re- it's a really interesting conversation, and I bet no one who works in factories, not many people that work in factories, ever give a second thought to capitalism and that they're daily seeing the results of that system, you know, and how they're treated yeah. at work. Yeah, I know. Um, we we had that as well. I I I was over the moon. I got like my first graduate job because I I was a teenage mum and then went to university with my little girl with me, um, who's big 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 girl now with a little girl of her own. <laughs> um and uh th- so the but after that I had like a year of unemployment as a graduate and then I got my first job and it was 16 grand and I can remember being like ah you know <laughs> I've made it it's great and um and it was great we felt like really wealthy you know um mm-hmm. and I reached the giddy heights of like 30 grand eventually after 10 years but then I had like you I had you know there was 2008 and the crash and then it was just a redundancy and then a few years later another redundancy contract length got shorter and shorter so people weren't taken on permanent contracts anymore and, and the length of contracts was getting shorter and all of those terms and conditions were diminished and they expected a lot more in terms of your skills and, and everything for a lot less you know for each of the yeah. jobs we've seen a massive sort of um I don't know what the word for it is but it's degrading really of um jobs and what you know what skills are needed and how much you can earn right the way through the spectrum I think working yeah. in, in digital um and I I remember working because I was an art worker for a while free, freelance art worker so mm-hmm. Um, in the early days, designers didn't touch computers. Yeah. Um, so you had a Mac operator. And yeah. So the designer would do uh, a marker visual and uh, of a couple of pages of a brochure, say. So you'd have all the text and all the images on the computer and you mm-hmm. put it, make it digital so that it could be printed. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I get to do a bit of design, but then I remember the mid nineties and a couple of the, and when I started as an art worker, actually, there weren't many women doing it. It was, it was usually lads. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, it was quite lucrative in the beginning. Um, but then one day I was, I was working, uh, in a, in a studio and and some of the lads were looking at uh, mucking around with different bits of software and bits of code and um I was like well what they're doing then I I want a piece of that you know Mm -hmm. and started trying to get involved in it um and it was a small company where if you wanted to you know help out with something they were only too happy for you to um to join in mm-hmm. it was all hands on deck sort of attitude you you don't get that so much these days mm-hmm. um so I thought well if the boys are doing it it's going to be well-paid work you yeah. know it's I kind of learned yeah. that yeah in any 
office, what the boys were doing was was well paid. <laughs> it was a, a concentration of men doing a particular job. Yeah, that's where the money was. So yeah. I would make a concerted effort. <laughs> you know, that, that's how I earn more money. You know. Yeah. Um, and I I started doing that sort of work. But of course, with with digital, it's it's become it's become ridiculous now, where every every year, year there's about a dozen new frameworks or there's a new language or there's a new way of doing something. And I, for years, I spent a tremendous amount of my spare time mm-hmm. and a considerable amount of money because before sort of YouTube tutorials and all that, you know, you bought a book, a yeah. big thick. Yeah, with all the, the you know a bit expensive language, you know all the code or or wow. software, you know mm-hmm. tutorials in, mm-hmm. and that's that's you know what what I used to spend most of my spare time doing was trying to upscale, mm. trying to keep, trying to keep up with. Yeah the rate at which it was all moving Mm -hmm. and you find that you'd learn something really well and then after a couple of years you couldn't earn so much money doing that yes you'd have to try and find the next thing and you can do that for so long yeah but then you get to a stage where there are so many new things yeah you don't know what to learn and it's just a case of of guessing and it's like Mm -hmm. oh well I'll try and learn that then. But if you've picked the wrong thing right. and it dies to death, because things right. new frameworks come out. Yeah. And it's like, oh, everyone's using this. Oh, no one uses that anymore. Everyone's yeah. using this now. Yeah. But then sometimes that's gone within a couple of months because something else has gone. Yes. Out. Yeah. And it's it's become uh, just an impossible task. Yeah. You can look at um, a job spec. Mm-hmm. for you know a web developer or um you know anything anything to do with digital mm-hmm. um and there's an a ridiculous list of skills and software that are on there and I look at them and I think the person that wrote this job spec mm-hmm. has absolutely no idea about mm-hmm what is involved in this job mm-hmm. you know mm. um yeah and I nobody you know you look at the list of of things and you think nobody knows all that mm-hmm. yeah so, it sounds quite stressful quite stressful it's yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sick of it I've had enough of it that's a that's a hard <laughs> way to yeah be trying to make a living <laughs> so, yeah. yeah you just feel like you're, you're constantly trying to keep up and mm-hmm. like I said it's all right for a while mm. and then you just think oh it's just snowed under now yeah I think I was hoping that um and I still hope really that the less one of the lessons that we should have learned from the crisis or that we can learn from the crisis is that the jobs that they don't have the status and the pay so they're not valued by society, but they're basic, important jobs that we're always going to need people to do. Because one of the things that, you know, if you like, like within councils, a lot of the messaging and, and governments as well, and a lot of the reports that go out around poverty and what we can do about it, they're to do with like, well, we need to get more people into jobs, you know. And if we get people into jobs, um, we need to also make sure that people who are on low incomes are trained so that they can get the better jobs. You know, so it's like there's a hierarchy of jobs and and value. And you just think, well, hang on, that doesn't solve the problem of poverty because you're always going to have jobs that we need as a society, which has been clearly shown, you know, through the pandemic, um, which are undervalued and underpaid and people who are doing them we shouldn't make the assumptions that you know like as you said that they're not intelligent and don't have potential to be doing other things but if they're you know if they're willing and prepared to do those jobs and they're hard work they're knackering you come home really tired I mean I've worked for a cleaner like after my dizzy heights of me 30 grand I um, got made redundant couldn't get another you know there weren't any jobs doing what I'd been doing it was kind of um the last um most secure job that I'd had was around domestic managing domestic abuse project but the funding got cut from things like that um so there are still jobs where you can do but there's far fewer resources available for things like that and um so I was a cleaner I was scraping by 
um, didn't mind you know, doing cleaning, I quite like it, it's therapeutic. But what I really didn't like was that people's attitude towards you changes. So I'd been working in the same place. <laughs> you know, I'd yeah. go in, because I'm trained to teach Zumba as well. So I'd go in as a freelance to teach a Zumba class. And uh, I'd get treated like a freelance. And then by the same staff, I'd go in to do my cleaning shift. And like, <laughs> they wouldn't look at you twice. And you think I'm the same person. It's like, <laughs> I was trying to make up for it. <laughs> They, they knew it was me it's just that they couldn't be polite to me because I was doing a, the cleaner's job and they're above that you know and it's like our society needs to learn that we're always going to need people to do to clean places and you know to do fa factory or whatever it is you know the things that have been classed as low status and maybe not everybody wants to be in a line of work anymore you know where you have to constantly stress yourself out to death trying to yeah. preempt which road to go down in order to not financially crash you know so yeah. we need a society that values people really values people and what they have to offer and you know and it can't just be about well get closer to the jobs market if there's poverty wages where you can't afford to feed yourself or your family and it can't just yeah. be about train and get into a better job because those other jobs are still going to need doing by somebody so, you know, mm -hmm. just pay them properly and then we don't have to always constantly be trying to shift people up the ladder, you know, um, yeah. it's not going to solve the problem anyway. So when I think about it, when I think of all my struggling with my career and, and, and trying to get better, learn more. Mm -hmm. And I've never I've never gone for management jobs. I've never wanted management jobs. Mm -hmm. um, I've always enjoyed doing the work making the thing um but when I think about it now you know 30 odd years in work mm -hmm. and here I am I've got a I live in a rented house my car's about 13 years old I don't have a holiday every year I've never no. been able to afford a holiday every year no. and when I do go it's just a, a long weekend in Amsterdam yeah or, and you, you feel know, guilty because you think I shouldn't really be spending and that think, money. Yeah. Yeah. I think what what good did it do me? You know, all those hours of like, oh, well, yeah. no, I can't come out to the pub tonight. I've got yeah. to learn this new thing. Yeah. And you think, well, it's not really done me much good. And I wonder if if I stayed in the factory, if I was, well, actually, I could still be redundant if I, you know, stayed in the factory. But yeah. Yeah. at the end of the day, my life would be my own. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be worrying about. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, it's a really interesting point. If you're from a working class background and you try to do the right thing or what you think is the right thing to get yourself in a more stable position, it doesn't always work out that way. And sometimes you can end up thinking I should have just done something that was less stressful <laughs> in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, I don't think the career ladder is always as open to you either you know mm -hmm. if, if you are from a working class background in organizations that are middle class dominated you know there is mm -hmm. a there is a ceiling I think a lot of the time but that's a that's a bigger conversation we're coming up to the end of I think we've been chatting about an hour or something um I just I think I'll just um remind people before we go about the beehive because that's the group that we're both involved in <clears throat> which has also set up this recent other thing which is called the political education project you can find both of those on twitter um or get in touch with me at classactivist at gmail.com if you're not sure and last time i did say about the beehive that you don't have to read your material and i shouldn't have said that it's a much better experience in the session if you do read your reading material when you come to the sessions and there is kind of an expectation that you will um it's not really there just for people to listen in passively so some of us have not managed to read all of it you might have scanned through a bit of it or whatever if you've been busy and that's kind of but most of the time you need to try and have some of that reading digested and Alison and I have been reading through some really old texts which are dead hard to read <laughs> Dead, dead hard to read but when you go to the session having struggled like hell to try and make sense of it when people start discussing it then the, the, the parts start to fit together don't they and it does make a bit more sense and yeah. and reading those old texts it is insightful isn't it even though it's hard going sometimes so yeah and I think uh I think in the beginning I, I, I was quite quiet and didn't say much but after a couple of sessions I got brave enough to say actually I really didn't understand that and can someone 
just go through it. You know, I didn't yeah. understand that paragraph. And, yeah. And people will just explain. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it's, it's, it is a good group, isn't it? I've really, really enjoyed it and got a lot out of being part of that. And yeah, I feel more determined than ever that we need to make some cha radical changes and, and sort of measuring our success as a country by growth, growth, growth all the time. If that's not translating into people being able to have a holiday and not feel guilty about spending that money on a holiday, you know, and not being able to fix things in the house when they break and things like that, that's not success, you know. So we need to start measuring our success as a country differently don't we it can't just be based on growth 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 <laughs> i don't think economic yeah yeah, yeah. Qual quality quality of life mm -hmm. yeah i think so anyway i want to say thank you a massive thank you for um coming on to have this chat i've really enjoyed it we've been all around the houses it's not what really i had planned with me questions but maybe you can come back again and we can talk some more about other areas of work that you're involved in um you might have some more things developed around um your tenants union work and the rent strikes by that stage to tell us because i know you've got something that's in the early stages there as well um and trade union involvement as well so that'd be really cool and uh, thank you very much for for coming on i've enjoyed it thank you me too Good.